So for the ones that don't know me, uh, I am originally trained as, uh, as an economist. I studied NGO management at the London School of Economics and completed uh, very recently my PhD at London Business School in precisely strategy and entrepreneurship uh, communication. Before my PhD, I worked for three years at the Social Entrepreneurship Institute, where I interacted with a lot of social entrepreneurs and with whom I learned, um, I learned a lot uh, of uh, maybe the content that I'll be presenting uh, here. So once again, uh, welcome everyone and I hope you enjoyed this webinar. So this webinar is part of the European Investment uh, Bank Institute and Catholic Lisbon series on social innovation, scaling and impact. And it is designed and delivered for the Social Innovation Tournament Alumni Network by Catholica Lisbon. Uh, this webinar will be recorded and the presentation will be made available to you after it. Uh, I would like this uh, to be you know, as interactive as we, as we, as we can. Uh, so you can use uh, this option, the race and uh, option at uh, Q&A if you want uh, to speak. So, uh, I'm not extremely familiar with, um, with this technology, but I promise that um, I'll keep an eye on this and make sure you have a voice if you want, okay? Uh, so let's start. I'll be talking here uh, about the role of language, language uh, in, uh, in persuasion. Aristotle is maybe one of the founding fathers of uh, communication theory, and he believed that uh, persuasion occurs when three components are represented. First of all, you have ethos, then you have logos, and then you have pathos. Basically, the ethos part is about establishing your own credibility as a speaker. The logos part is about using logic or reason to explain your arguments. And pathos is about an appeal to emotion. Obviously, as an entrepreneur, uh, there are a number of things you can uh, do to make sure you succeed in each of these uh, three uh, aspects. For instance, you can have a very good partner that gives your venture or yourself um, some credibility. You can have, for instance, strong evidence that your service or your product um, actually creates value for your customers. Or, for, for instance, you can have a very emotional story about yourself, about your venture, about your customers that can somehow convince investors through this emotional uh, path. Uh, what I'll be focusing today is not on this uh, content of your pitch, of your documents, of your presentations. It's more about the form, the way you frame your, your message, the way you use language to present yourself, your venture, or your organization. As a remark, I think it's important here uh, to note that persuasion is not necessarily um, uh, the same as manipulation, okay? So persuasion for me is just about presenting yourself, your venture, in a convincing way. It's about making your audience believe in what you are saying. Manipulation, or maybe successful manipulation, is a bit different. It requires some persuasion, okay, to be successful, but it has a different objective. So basically, with the manipulation, you want to change the behavior or a certain perception of others, but through the use of deception through lying. So in a way that benefits you and maybe hurts your, um, your, uh, your, um, your audience. Okay, so I thought this was an important point uh, because uh, it's always good to be clear about the concepts here. Okay, so let's start uh, with, with, with the language. So language is extremely important. You know that every aspect of your lives uh, in somehow you use, you use language. It is very important to establish and maintain relationships with other people. It is important and maybe essential to uh, make uh, conversations uh, possible. In situations in which you have to persuade investors, evidence says that you should be particularly careful. So this study, which I present here, a small, a small quote, says that uh, an investor spends an average of less than four minutes assessing your, 
you know, pitch decks. This is a very interesting study. You have the link below. Uh, it's, it, it's a study from a company called DocSend, which actually can monitor how PowerPoints are used, and Professor Tom Eisenman. And it is based on more than 200 uh, startup companies. And it 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 uh, um, and 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 it shows uh, it, it concluded that investors actually spend a very short amount of time. So you have to be quick and you have to use language very strategically because in these uh, in these three four minutes, investors usually decide in a very speedy way and use what you've written and what you've said, if you're saying or, or, or writing in your, in your type of communication, okay? So in this webinar, my objective is to provide you with nine research-based uh, language tricks, three for each of, uh, of the persuasion components that are presented uh, before, that you can hopefully immediately apply to your communication process with, uh, with, uh, with investors. So this is my objective. And so let me just check, yes. Everything is okay. Okay, so let me just uh, start now with uh, with the first. So I'll, as I mentioned, I'll start with the uh, ethos part, and uh, I'll I'll give you th three tricks uh, only for this uh, for this uh, for this part here. All these tricks, just to summarize this ethos part, are tricks that help uh, you increase how your audience perceive your own credibility as a speaker, okay? So here the first trick is related to deceptive language. So as humans, we are constantly trying to search for reasons to trust other people. And we do that extremely quickly. We do that by assessing the facial expressions, the facial features of the, of, of, of the of the, um, of, of the face and obviously through the use of language. There is a lot of evidence that when you are lying, you use language differently, okay? And this language can actually be detected by audiences and used against us. So in this paper that I'm presenting you, which you can see the authors in the, um, in the bottom right, uh, these authors analyzed more than th uh, 30,000 live speeches from, from top managers, from large companies. And the authors, basically what they did, they compare the speeches from, uh, from the ones that have lied during that presentation with the ones that haven't lied about the results of the company. So what they found is that these two groups have some similarities, obviously, but they are different in some very specific ways. So the liars would use more references to general knowledge. And this means using expressions like, you would agree that, or everyone, every, everybody knows that. And they also use more extreme positive uh, emotion language. For example, oh, this is a brilliant company, or brilliant results, or fantastic situation in which we are. What the, the ones that did not lie used more is, words associated with anxiety, for example, saying, oh, I'm worried about the future of this company, or I'm fearful about the environment, and also some non-extreme positive emotions, like love, nice, accept, okay? So the recommendation here is that this study does not show immediately uh, that the audiences of these presentations were able to detect this. This study only says that the liars have these types of profiles. So if you want to be somehow perceived as a non-liar, maybe you should use more anxiety words and non-extreme positive emotions words and reduce the use of references to general knowledge and extreme positive emotion words. So this was the first trick. Let's go to the second trick. The second trick is related to management jargon, which is commonly used, commonly found in excess in all kinds of corporate and entrepreneurial communications. For instance, words like bootstrapping or disruptive or iterate, pivot or traction, they are words in which you can see maybe in all pitch decks that you can find or all pitches uh, that you can find from, from, from investors, from, from, from entrepreneurs. And, and, uh, and, and you can see here, I include here a, a website in which you actually can generate your own jargon expressions by following that link. You just click generate and you'll see that, uh, that it will generate some kind of a sentence, which is similar, for instance, to that one 
that you can see uh, in this Dilbert cartoon. So basically the boss says our differentiating value added strategy is <coughs> transformational change. <coughs> so, so obviously you can see that this type of language may be uh, useful um, um, because usually entrepreneurs or top managers have to explain complicated concepts and these are the words to use in those contexts uh, among, for example, knowledgeable people from that particular context. But as illustrated here in this uh, cartoon, usually this type of language, when it's used uh, a little bit too much, is generally viewed as uh, negative. There are always ways to say these words or concepts in a different way which are less associated with jargon or management speak. Um, in, the, in this paper that I have with my, with my, uh, my co-author Frank Vermoulin, uh, we examine the use of this type of language by top managers when they are explaining large strategic decisions to investors and financial analysts. We created uh, an interesting dictionary of these, of, these, of these words and expressions and measured their prominence in, uh, in around 1500 of these management presentations. What we conclude by this analysis is that management speak actually triggers a very negative reaction uh, from the market, basically because investors feel suspicious about the way the manager is saying. They feel that the management, when they use a lot of these words, are trying to hide or obfuscate the real motives for the large decision they are making. <clears throat> so the Greek myth of uh, Narcissus, which you can see a very beautiful uh, painting over there by, by Caravaggio, gives name to the third trick in this group. So narcissism is, is a very famous uh, uh, concept is defined as an excessive admiration for oneself. Obviously it is associated with and it is characterized by a persistent preoccupation of, of, with, with success, a need for authority, competitiveness and pervasive uh, patterns of grandiose uh, thinking. Uh, so these uh, authors uh, from this study, Aaron Anglin and his colleagues, created a very rich dictionary with around 3,000 words associated with these seven characteristics of narcissism. For example, authority, words like control, command, supremacy, or exhibitionism, for example, brilliant, fantastic, huge, or vanity, proud, grandiose, popular. And what they did, they assessed how the presence of these words affect the success of crowdfunding campaigns in a sample of around 2,000 um, 2,000 campaigns from the widely known uh, Kickstarter website. So what they say is that the use of moderate amounts of this type of language is expected in the role of a successful entrepreneur. So this type of language, using this type of language, usually <coughs> sorry, conveys characteristics such as confidence and strength, which are usually associated with successful entrepreneurs. However, high levels of narcissistic uh, rhetoric convey characteristics such as instability or untrustworthiness, which are somehow inconsistent with successful entrepreneurs. So what the paper finds, and I took this uh, graph here from, 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 from the paper itself, is that if you have a low use of these words that I include here, or if you have a high use of these words that you can see here, you will be equally unsuccessful. <coughs> you will be successful if you use a moderate amount of these words, which is exactly this middle that you can find here. So here is, uh, here the, the advice is, you know, just know about these words, know how they are perceived, and use them not too little and not too much. The paper actually finds uh, that this relationship is valid for the probability of being funded, the number of bakers that you can get in your crowdfunding campaign, and the amounts of funds uh, raised. <coughs> Sorry. So next, let's focus on, uh, on tricks to clarify your message and make it appear 
more logical and more reasonable. So here research in, uh, in, 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 in cognitive psychology has produced a lot of evidence about the fluency heuristic. That is, the more fluently, smoothly and quickly we process something, the more value we place in it. So if you present your idea in a very complicated way, it is likely that it will be judged as having lower quality if, uh, uh, um, when you compare it to uh, an idea presented in a less complicated way. Um, the, 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 the fog index uh, is, is maybe the most famous uh, readability measure. Please don't be uh, frightened by these, uh, these expressions. It's a very simple expression, actually. And it is calculating using this formula that, I, that I've put there. So basically, the formula uh, is uh, based on the number of words that you include per sentence. So that's the, the first part of the, of the formula. And the second part is about the percentage of words which are complex. And here complex means having three syllables or more. more. OK, so this formula actually generates a grade level, typically between 0 and 20. And the formula estimates actually the number, the number of years of formal education the reader requires to understand the text on the first reading. So if a piece of text has a grade level, for instance, of 6, it means that you need six years of, um, of schooling. In this case, it will be being in the sixth grade in the US, for example. So you need to be around 12 years old to understand the text that it's been uh, written. So the text, you have some, some kind of uh, rule of thumb there uh, in which if the fog index is higher than 18, maybe the text is completely unreadable. Uh, if it's between 14 and 18, um, it's relatively difficult. Between 12 and 14 is, uh, is maybe the ideal. Uh, and then you have all the other, the other characteristics until the, other one, the, the final one, which is, so if the text is too simple, maybe it's childish, and so it is not perceived very well um, uh, as well. So what I have here we, uh, for you, it's a website you can use to actually input your, your, uh, your text, your short text that, I, that, 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 that you have and test your, uh, your fog index. So here what you have is actually the description of this webinar, which uh, I carefully uh, constructed, in which you can see that the fog index is actually 12.2, which is you know, in, this ideal, uh, in this ideal bracket over there. So you can see, for instance, that this website measures the number of sentences, which is an important input for the formula, the number of words, and then the number of words with three or plus uh, syllabus. And this is the three uh, elements that you need to compute the, uh, the above uh, formula. So in this, in this paper that I include there in the bottom right, Lee 2008, measures this fog index for, um, for about 50,000 annual reports, which companies have to submit in the end of the year. Uh, and what he finds is that the higher this readability index, so the more unreadable the text is, the lower the performance of the company is in the present, and the lower the company performance is in the future. So it means that having this unreadability, in a way, actually hurts and harms your own performance, and it is largely correlated with that. I mean, the argument here is that investors cannot understand, cannot really understand what you are saying if you are saying something very complex, OK? Um, so let's go for the, next, uh, for the next one. Another important aspect that makes communications uh, more uh, logical and organized is how concrete you are. And let me jump directly to this, to this paper. This paper by Ling Ling Pan and their colleagues used uh, these six types of words, let's say verbs, numbers, past-focused words, adjectives, non-specific quantifiers, and future-focused words. And aggregated them to, to, to have a measure of concreteness. What, what they say is that the use of verbs, numbers and past-focused words, past-focused words are, for example, the word yesterday or ago or verbs in the past, are usually associated with more concrete expressions. And words like adjectives, non-specific quantifiers and future-focused words, non-specific quantifiers are, for example, a lot, a few, several, 
which are non-specific uh, descriptions of the quantities. And future focus words are, for example, tomorrow, soon, upcoming, will. So the use of these three types of words are usually associated with being less concrete. And what they find in this paper, it's a very interesting, uh, very interesting and very recent paper, uh, what they find is that investors react more positively when the language is more concrete. And what they find as well is when the results of the company are more surprising, that's when you need more concreteness. Because somehow when the results are unexpected, the investors will try to figure out what the company is saying or what the company is presenting and that's where concreteness is important. You can have here a graph, I mean it's, uh, it's, it's once again taken from, from, the, um, from the paper and you can see the investor's reaction which is plotted in the Y uh, side, the low, the, the, if the document has, uh, has a low, uh, low concreteness the reaction from the market is relatively small and it is much higher with higher concreteness, okay? So this was the fifth, so this is the second one within the Logos uh, section. Let me jump now to the next one, the third one in the, um, in the, um, in the Logos uh, section. So this is about lexical uh, density. So if language is very rich, what happens uh, is is that it compromises how precise you are when describing uh, the concepts or the organization or yourself. So an entrepreneur, for instance, can use the synonyms of device, tool, gadget, widget or apparatus during their presentation to describe their product, but otherwise the entrepreneur can use only device to constantly describe their product. So the precise language was measured here by this uh, lexical density, which is basically the number of unique words divided by the total number of words. So what these uh, authors uh, do is that they go through uh, a bunch of videos in, uh, once again, crowdfunding campaigns listed in Kickstarter, and what they find is that if you use less unique words, so if you use always the same word to describe the same concept, so that's the, 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 the real um, implication of this uh, of these finding, they find that they would boost their success, but only for social ventures. So this is an important thing because maybe if you are in a non uh, a non-social venture, maybe you don't need to be, to be precise. Uh, but this is, this, is, this is what they find, they theorize about, about this effect. Uh, once again, you can find websites, so these are, you know, for these formulas I always provide you with, uh, with a website in which you can automatically calculate that. Uh, so this is, um, this is another website which is a useful website which you can use to measure um, uh, to measure uh, this lexical density with and without stop words. You can have a look at this, uh, at this website and, and, and see. The, the numbers you see here are actually, once again, for, the, for my description, my own description of this, of this webinar. Uh, and we can discuss a bit more uh, that in the end if you, if you like. Um, So now let's move to uh, pathos, basically the appeal to emotion. So here it is very important, I mean some people would say that, uh, that actually the emotion side plays an important, a very important role when you're trying to convince someone. Actually it is a component and I don't mean it is not a component here, it is as important as the other components. So I think that you have to have that in mind, simply displaying a lot of passion doesn't give you, doesn't, uh, doesn't uh, immediately trigger a, a whole bunch of, uh, of investors uh, coming, uh, coming to you and invest in your venture, for example. Okay? It is important to appeal to emotion, it's not only important to appeal to emotion. So let's see these three uh, tricks that you can easily use to appeal to emotion in your uh, documents or your presentations. The first one is about uh, interactivity. Interacting with your audience is likely to increase their receptivity because it elicits uh, trust and likability 
and people tend to prefer speakers who seem closer to them. Demonstrating interactivity by asking questions or inviting feedback can help entrepreneurs show that responsiveness, especially if you are dealing with, a, with an event in which you cannot personally interact with investors. Imagine an annual report or imagine a crowdfunding campaign in which you have to specify your message and the message will keep being there static and you cannot directly look in the eyes of your investor. So, there are tricks to do this. One of them is to actually include questions within your written documents. Sometimes it can be perceived as a bit weird, but that will increase the proximity between your, your audience and yourself or your adventure. The authors, once again, counted the number of questions the entrepreneurs uh, used in, in, in these videos from crowdfunding campaigns and they actually found an effect that these questions, or questioning, actually plays an important role in maximizing the success, the probability of being funded in these campaigns, the probability of having more bakers in these campaigns, and once again the probability of, of reaching higher amounts of, um, of, um, um, of funded amounts. Okay? Um, the next one is uh, positivity. So, uh, positivity or uh, positive um, psychological capital, it can be uh, framed in, in, in these two ways, uh, portrays uh, a venture or an organization that is hopeful regarding the ability to meet goals, optimistic about the future, resilient in the face of adversity and confident in its abilities. So entrepreneurs in high positivity are perceived to be more authentic and somehow these pronounced displays of confidence, optimism, hope, resilience facilitate similar beliefs in the eyes of the audience. So these, these, uh, these authors here, uh, Anglin uh, et al. Uh, in 2018, first created an interesting uh, dictionary based on these categories. For example, optimism is the use of words like confident or encouraged or ideal and hope, for example, words like believe, aspire, goal or resilience, uh, words like committed, consistent, persevere. And what they did, they sum all instances of each of these groups of words in around 2,000 crowdfunding campaigns from Kickstarter and also around 2,000 um, crowdfunding campaigns from Kiva, which is an alternative, a more socially oriented uh, crowdfunding website. And the results are quite, um, maybe quite, quite surprising. Actually, what they find is that the probability of being funded and the amount of funds raised through Kickstarter actually increase uh, when you increase the number of words associated with productivity. Also what they find for the other context, for the Kiva context, is that the amount of funds raised and the number of days to get funded is actually more positive when you use these types of words. So the final, um, the final trick um, uh, for these, uh, for the pathos uh, section refers to psychological distancing. So I included here two uh, brief statements, one just to illustrate the concept here, one with high uh, psychological distance saying that many products are missing in the marketplace, products that would make people's lives um, uh, lives easier, the venture design talent will make it possible to fulfill these untapped needs in the marketplace. The other one says, I have found many products that I felt would solve many problems in my life. Because of my background, I was able to develop these products and started an online store to share them with you. So you can see here the difference. The difference is when you have a low psychological di distance, what happens is you feel when you are reading this, you are closer to the one that is speaking. Okay, so you are emotionally more attached to the person that is speaking. 
What these uh, authors uh, actually noticed is that to decrease psychological distance, which is usually positive, okay, so it's good to be closer to your audience, you need to use more the first person pronouns, namely I, we, mine, and use also a little bit more of negative emotion words that said hurt, sad, suffer. So there is some evidence that um, distant communicators, I guess the first, the, 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 the first person pronouns is relatively stable. So we understand that if we talk in our first person, it will be closer to us and then it will somehow trigger the same with your audience. You will seem closer to your venture or to the present circumstances in which you are and so the audience will perceive that. The second one, the negative emotion words, I would say that it's a bit more difficult to explain. But there's some evidence that distant communicators, people that actually have a stronger or higher distance between themselves and the topic they are, they are, um, they are talking about, they would avoid talking about their personal challenges or other negative um, emotions situations. So that's why if you use a little bit of these negative emotion words, it will, it will feel or it will be perceived by the audience that you are closer to the topic or your venture that you are, uh, you are presenting. Okay? And once again, the authors uh, from this study measured these two key variables, the first person pronouns and negative emotion words, in, um, in a sample of videos. So they extracted the text from the video and coded, um, uh, coded the videos uh, to measure the presence of these, of these words. And what they find is that for social ventures, for social entrepreneurs, it is very important to decrease the psychological distance. That means using more I, we and mine and using more negative emotion words like hurt, sad, suffer, etc. Okay? So I guess I'm going, uh, I'm going maybe too fast. So let me talk a bit About, uh, about a summary here, okay? So here you can find all these nine tricks and then we'll open two questions, obviously. I think, I think that, 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 that could be a good plan. I was uh, thinking uh, while I'm, I'm presenting. Uh, I mean, be before, before I jump into this uh, cheat sheet here, um, I mean, there's, there, are, there are obviously some limitations in all these studies. These studies, for instance, focus on very particular uh, contexts, like, for example, the crowdfunding text, or the crowdfunding videos, or in live CEO speeches, or in written documents like annual reports. But what you, th what you should think about here is, is the argument behind all these, all these types of words, or all these language, okay? So, so I guess they are quite generalizable and all the arguments that I've explained to you and I think if you have some doubt regarding any other, um, any of these, um, any of these types of language, I can, I can, I, I, we can definitely talk a bit more about that. But here what I did was, uh, if you want to remember something from this presentation or print something to be in your desk, so this is the right, the right slide here. And I usually have always one, one slide like this because once again people are quite busy and they cannot go through a presentation uh, all the time. And so here you have your, my, my, my cheat sheet from this uh, presentation. You have these three uh, components that I've talked to you about the, um, about the persuasion process and these are ethos, logos and pathos. And you can see the three tricks here summarized for each of these components. So in the first one, let's go to the ethos one, you have deceptive language, management jargon and narcissistic rhetoric. Regarding the deceptive language part, just avoid references to general knowledge, such as everybody knows that, or we all know that, and avoid also extreme positive emotion words. They are usually perceived as deceptive and they will trigger a bad reaction from your investors. On the other side, use more anxiety words and positive emotion words. They are important because they'll give you credibility. It, it will be, you will be perceived that you are talking truth. 
Then regarding management jargon, we talked about that. Just use the only essential management jargon you need. Just minimize it. When you are thinking that a certain word is a, a management jargon word or entrepreneurship jargon word, just think more carefully and think and, and, and try to figure out if there's an alternative to that word. Regarding narcissistic rhetoric, you can use these types of words, the words that I've mentioned above, but only moderately. Remember that if you use a low amount of these words, you'll be penalized. If you use a high amount of these words, you'll be also penalized. So you have to find an equilibrium there and frame your message using these words, but only moderately. Regarding the logos apart, just decrease both the word length and the sentence length. Try to, to write and to speak with words that are that have below three syllables. There's always lots of alternatives to the words you are using. And also sentences, just think about the length of your sentences and try to decrease them as much as you can. Regarding concreteness, just use more verbs, numbers and past-focused words. Be careful with using adjectives, non-specific quantifiers like a lot, several, some and also future-focused words. Usually these words are perceived as less clear and thus they are usually penalized by investors. And then the last one, the lexical density. Remember my example about the device. There are lots of words to say the same concept, but just be careful. Use always the same word to convey the same concept. Maybe you feel that you'll be a little bit more monotone, but it is definitely clearer to talk in this way and thus you'll be perceived as more organized and more logical in your arguments. And finally, the last part, pathos, it is about interactivity, positivity and psychological distance. Interactivity, you can, even in written documents, you can interact with your audience. Remember, my, my own description of this webinar contains, I think, three questions and I'm not interacting with you, but using those questions within these uh, within these small texts, or actually large documents, it will increase the proximity between yourself and the audience. And regarding positivity, you have a whole list of words associated with optimism, hope, resilience, confidence. Just use them. I think, you know, obviously, this point is a bit closer to, uh, to the one I mentioned about deceptive language. And obviously, if you, if you abuse the extremely positive emotion words, that doesn't work. But use words that convey hope, resilience, confidence, optimism. Those words are important and investors will value them. And finally, psychological distance. Just use more the first person, like I, me, mine, my and some negative emotion words because you will feel that your, your investors will feel that you are closer to your venture, closer to the problem you are solving, closer to your organization and they will give you some premium for that. So thank you very much for your attention and now I guess I can open for some questions from the audience, if there are some questions. If not, we can just close. I cannot see... No questions, okay. Michel, thank you. So, you'll be able, so I think Michel asked um, if we can get the recorded video. Sorry, I just looked at this now. Sorry, uh, once again. So yes, you can get the recorded video for sure in the slides. I guess I talked a little bit uh, too much and too um, quickly, so that definitely it can be it can be important. Ah, so uh, sorry, no questions. Ah, so Christian, sorry, sorry about your. So I didn't see your question above. So so negative words with a positive attitude. So that's a good that, that's a good point because. Um, and let me put again in this, uh, in this uh, cheat sheet, which can be interesting. Uh, so it is, it is interesting, and I, and I told you that there are some not conflicting um, ideas here, but actually you should use both. You should use positive emotion words that will trigger some perception that you are not lying, 
not extremely positive words, but positive words, and also you should use some negative emotion words precisely to make yourself closer to your to your uh, venture. So maybe that's a good idea, you know, some negative words, also positive words, always with some kind of a positive attitude. I think that's important. The optimism, the hope, the resilience you convey, that's definitely important to get your uh, investors' attention. Ah, Xavier. Xavier is asking what about abuse of silences between the words and emphasize or even scalp words or expressions in the speech in front of an audience. So the silences, uh, so it's interesting, I now recall a paper that, uh, that actually uh, talks about that. It's not exactly about that, but it's about um, not answering questions. So there's a paper in which, you know, what they do, they go through these live manager presentations and what they do, they measure whether the top manager waits a little bit before answering a question, but that's a different, that's a different point because basically what they are suggesting is that if you mm, take too long to answer a question it means that you don't really know the answer and so it conveys some lack of understanding to the market. The silence is, I think, you know, the, the evidence from at least public speaking books is that pausing, get yourself together again, it's, it is actually uh, very important. Um, I mean, obviously in written documents is a bit less, less important because there's no silence, but I think they are important. That's something that I, that I, um, that I haven't, uh, you know, uh, fully, uh, fully used here because I talk maybe too fast, but that's usually good. So, Severin, thank you. So, I don't know similar studies for German, actually. Um, yeah, maybe, maybe in the, so I'm not familiar with, uh, with, uh, with German language and maybe pathos, um, it's not fully applicable. So I'm not sure, I can, I can actually check. I mean, there's some, some there are definitely some studies using Dutch, um, so we can then in, in, uh, um, in, um, uh, we can then um, talk a bit more and I can try to find some, um, some studies for German. So is there any other question, uh, some feedback? I guess we still have some time, so I think it's... Uh <coughs> Thank you, Severine, again. Thank you, Francisco, as well. Good to see you here. Uh Ah, I guess Raquel, Raquel, sorry. Raquel, very good to see you here as well. So, uh, the discussion about this social entrepreneurship versus entrepreneurship. So, most of these results are actually generic, or the arguments are generic to both social and more traditional entrepreneurs. So, some of these that I talked about, in specific, interactivity, psychological distance, and lexical density, so basically six, seven, and nine, and this is for Raquel who asked if this is just for social entrepreneurs or entrepreneurs. These three, for sure, the empirical evidence, obviously the arguments is a different, it's a different story, but the empirical evidence point that they are very important for social entrepreneurs or for ventures who are considered uh, social in, in, in uh, in a crowdfunding uh, setting, and the effect could not be found for the um, uh, for the traditional ventures. That can be due to multiple uh, to multiple um, factors, but these uh, three, at least, they are found to be important, very important, or more important for social entrepreneurs, and um, not so much for traditional entrepreneurs. The others. I mean, obviously, these, uh, as, as I told you, one of, uh, one of the limitations here is that all these findings, which I compiled here uh, for you, all these findings are uh, generic and they are actually found in different contexts. For example, what I told you about uh, management jargon, which I'm very familiar, it is for live presentations from top CEOs. I mean, obviously, you can then extrapolate for, uh, for entrepreneurs because there is management jargon 
and there's entrepreneurship jargon as well. Okay. Um, what uh, obviously the argument can be extrapolated, but in this case, for example, the management jargon, we we found support for very large companies and very large. Uh, events from uh, you know top CEOs. We can argue the same for for entrepreneurs. The same with deceptive language. So, for instance, you can see that you know there might be the case that uh, deceptive language can be um, can have a different effect, or certain words can have a different effect for entrepreneurs. Here, what they find is for actually live presentations from management talking about results, financial results from large companies. Okay, what I what I want to stress here is, you know, this empirical evidence being only in one specific context doesn't mean that um, that this is not applicable in settings which are not uh, not uh, not the ones which are empirically texted, um, uh, examined. I mean, obviously, the theory here, the argument, is valid for any type of communication and I think these types of uh, this type of review that I did here is closer to what a manager or entrepreneur would um, would um, would perceive or, or would, would like to see and are supported for the management um, area so here uh, Miguel Miguel okay thank you yes I mean definitely so as, as I was saying I mean I think I think these uh, so these three components are not only for entrepreneurs or managers. What I'm saying is that the empirical evidence for these nine tricks are in the management and, and, uh, and entrepreneurship, uh, but obviously they are very important for public speaking in general, I would say. So, um, so I guess all these uh, tricks can be used uh, even in, uh, in more personal uh, settings. I would use them uh, carefully because the empirical support is more for a business environment, but they are definitely useful. Uh, Okay, uh, so let me see Flipper. Um, how would you, and the question from Flipper Souza, how would you advise to manage communication with investors when the ground of the initiative is new? Yeah, when the mission of the initiative doesn't change, but concepts, keywords might need to be adapted with time as the project unrolls. Okay, so. So I think so. Some of these, uh, some of these that I talked to you, for example, the concreteness uh, argument, um, it is extremely important, and it is more important as I showed you, when the firm is presenting something surprising. Okay. So being more cr cr concrete, having a more readable document, or having, for example, a lexical density which is uh, lower, this is particularly important when there are surprises in the content that you are transmitting. So we can map that to what Filippo was saying. So Filippo was saying that, you know, um, how would you advise when the initiative is new? I mean, novelty here is a very important thing. Uh, and, and I think, you know, all these, all these arguments Specifically, for example, the logos ones are particularly important when they are surprising, when things are new. Okay, so what we find also in the um, in the which one is that is um, yeah for the concreteness one is when the um, when the company is a little and that's something that I didn't cover here when the company is more stressed in terms of uh, finances when it's di more difficult to sell the company and to sell the venture so you can map that to an entrepreneurship context in which you know the idea is um, is still okay but I, we haven't proved yet the concept or we are changing the concept suddenly and then investors may you know may be a bit suspicious so what they prove is that concreteness is especially important here um, so I think I think that's that's what I what I would add to uh, to Felipe's point uh, here um, I'm not sure do, do you want to clarify something uh, Philippa uh, because you seem to have a particular case in mind. So the mission of the initiative doesn't change, but the concepts change. Keywords or activities maybe, no? Um. Okay, okay, okay. So I guess, yeah, the investigation, the, the, the experiment, 
expectation is particularly difficult to sell to investors, I would say. So I guess these tricks can be... So imagine, for instance, that, um, that you are presenting something that you've been thinking about, which is very innovative or very experimental, okay? Research, okay, okay, I understand. Making research, okay. So, but I think one, one point that I, that, I, that I would have is, if you are presenting something which is more difficult to sell to your investors, the investors will be, for sure, more suspicious about what you are saying. Uh, for instance, in another project I have, what I find is um, some devices that clarify what you are saying are particularly important when the firm is making somehow a more unique move. A more unique move is, for instance, beginning to work in a certain area which they've never worked before. So what I find there is that something um, Devices that clarify the message are particularly important in that, in that particular uh, part. And I would argue that, for example, the deceptive language would be particularly important if you are talking about something which is completely new or completely novel or something that it's not really um, something that you've been involved before. And I guess the management jargon is, 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 is the same and maybe the, the narcissistic rhetoric. So imagine framing your message with some of these narcissistic words saying that you are extremely ambitious, you are overselling yourself and it's something experimental and you cannot really uh, say that much. So, you know, investors are usually, on average, um, they will uh, uh, somehow penalize you by being overly confident there and so maybe something uh, to, to take into consideration when you are framing your 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 message okay thank you Flipa. so i'm not sure there's maria albuquerque okay thank you thank you maria as well so let me see if there's some other points some other questions i'm happy to answer everything i mean there's a lot of research in this area and i'm happy to share with you uh, some more maybe in another webinar or maybe uh, uh, privately, we can talk definitely about this. Okay, so any other question? Any particular case that you want to share with us? For example, the use of certain of these uh, words that could be a good example for others here? Because that could be interesting that you, for example, if you used or tried to use one of these tricks uh, before, uh, you didn't realize that was actually a trick, and maybe that could be a constructive point for, uh, for the audience here. No? Okay, so I guess there's no more comments. So, so thank you very much for your, um, for your attention here. Um, we had, um, I guess, a good, a good session. We had very good questions. Uh, thank you very much for, uh, for everyone that who uh, answered um, and we asked uh, questions here. So I guess you have uh, up there the webinar evaluation. Uh, your feedback, I guess it's very important um, and, um, and I mm, definitely encourage you and I guess we have uh, a new message there with, with, uh, with evaluation uh, um, a link. So please feel completely free to, to, um, um, to actually visit me in Catholic or get in touch by 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 email you can always uh, also follow me on twitter i'm relatively recent there but i'm usually using twitter to actually share some of these research insights so if you want to know a bit more uh, a bit more insights about you know this link between entrepreneurship strategy and communication feel free to use all the channels you have in your um, um, all the channels that you feel comfortable with uh, reaching me Okay, so it was a pleasure to be here once again and thank you very much for your attention.